To introduce myself, my, I'm Sean Sabin. I work for the law firm Foley and Lardner. I specialize in government contract work, including issues related to compliance on government contracts. But this training extends beyond just government contract work that NCE and its subsidiaries may perform. It's also addressing any work that NCE does, and it's, uh, it's our integrity and compliance training. And a few people are still coming in the room here, so I'm not sure if, you're, if that, there'll be any uh, interruption of the broadcast. I, uh, I do want to bring up the fact, uh, first of all, for those of you who are listening at remote locations, hopefully you can hear me. If you can't, I know there's a way to communicate via email uh, or typed message. And so if you ha are having any trouble, please type a message and let us know here in Pontiac. Also, for people in the room here and for people listening remotely, please feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, don't feel you need to hold your questions back to the end. And uh, if you have a question at a remote location, just type it in and it'll be read to me and I'll try to answer it. Here's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give a, just a three-minute snapshot talk about government contracts and the federal acquisition regulation since it's new to some of you. Uh, I'll also discuss why compliance is important to NCE, why it's important in the setting of government contracts, and why it's important uh, in general just for a successful business. Uh, it's, it's important to the leadership of NCE, and it's the, the, this training is going to be given to all the uh, NCE and its subsidiary employees. So this is not just uh, something that's a one-time event and not taken seriously. I'll go over the code, which has been recently published. Uh, this is the code you should have at your locations. I know here at Pontiac they have codes for each individual subsidiary. And then there's an overall code for NCE. Uh, that's what I'll be discussing. I just want to make a distinction. There's also the employee handbook. I'll talk about it a little bit more. The employee handbook is a little bit different. There's some overlap between the two documents that I'll discuss. Uh, if there's nothing else you get out of this training, it's to get to understand the reporting mechanisms that are available to you as NCE employees. Uh, really the purpose of this training, if, if you don't get anything else out of it, is to understand what issues you, you should identify, and if you do identify the issue, who you should contact. After that, we can w w the, the NCE leadership and Foley and Lardner can walk you through what steps need to be taken after that. Uh, this training requirement is uh, being started this year and it will continue on an annual basis. I'll talk a little bit about if a government investigation occurs, what you should do, and, and I'll take questions at any time. So just to, this is a little bit off topic, but since the Government Contract Council is new and I've had some questions from some subsidiaries on how to work on a government contract and where you go in a government contract to get the answers to questions you may have, Obviously, uh, and of course, you certainly can contact me, and I welcome the opportunity to help you with issues. But uh, in addition to that, and as I'm talking to some of you about government contract issues, I realize, and I know many of you do realize this, almost everything you need to know is written in this book called the Federal Acquisition Regulation. And the trick is to try to figure out where in this very thick book you go to find the answer that you're looking for. And so uh, I wanted to let you to discuss with you briefly that there's an online website. I have it linked in on this, uh, web pre or on this PowerPoint presentation where you can get an online version of the FAR so you don't need to have a hard copy. And in fact, the art online version is preferable because it's updated daily and, this, and the uh, hard version is only updated on, a, on a, every a bi-annual basis. So the online version is the most current version of the FAR. Each agency that you, that is in the government has a supplement to the federal acquisition regulation. So you may have to look in the FAR itself and then one of its supplements. So if you're working on a Corps of Engineers project, you'll want to look at the Army supplement or you may need to look at the Army supplement and even the Corps of Engineers supplement to the FAR. And everything that's in a government contract is uh, in terms of compliance requirements, uh, requir work requirements are in the contract itself, but the compliance requirements in particular are found in the FAR clauses and they're listed in section, um, at least the compliance matters, are listed in section K of a government contract. And so if you go to section K as well as section I of a government contract, you'll see a list of FAR clauses. Uh, you can go to part 52 of the FAR. It'll then give you all the information or all the, the, the languages in that clause. 
because all you'll get is the title of the clause, and you may think it's not a lot of information, but one titled clause may be three or four pages of information. So you go to FAR Part 52.2, you go to the clause, you read the clause, and if you have questions, feel free to give me a call. So for example, a lot of the things I'm going to discuss with you today are found at uh, Part 3 of the FAR, which is Improper Business Practices, and then the clauses that are put in the contract that put this, put this requirement on NCE as a contractual requirement are found at 52.203. So the FAR Part 3 is found in the clause 03, 52.203. So there, there is a certain logic to how the FAR is set up. So for example, if you need a, a definition, if you're not sure of a definition in a government contract, you go to FAR par, Part 2. That'll give a lot of the definitions of the terms that are used in a government contract. If you have a labor law issue, you go to FAR Part 22, and then you can look at the clause that applies to your contract by going to FAR Part 52.2.22, and then look at the clause that applies. I know I've had some questions about Buy America Act requirements and the Recovery Act requirements and domestic sourcing. Those are found at FAR Part 25, and you can go to FAR 52.2.25. So I think you get the idea. Okay, so enough about government contracts, because as, as I said before, this extends beyond just government contracts. It's the integrity and training that's important to NCE for everything you do, whether it involves a government contract or not. Uh, it's important to the company because it, it, it uh, protects the company's commitment to business ethics and training. Uh, the reputation of this company is everything. If, it, if a company has a reputation or this company has a reputation of not being an honest broker, it's going to affect its ability to be a profitable company down the road. Uh, there is liability issues. If you don't make proper disclosures as required, then the company can be held liable for the, the failure to disclose things or, the, or, or not acting in an appropriate manner in terms of honest and fair dealing. But I think more important than all those things, there's also a contractual requirement to do this, but also it's, it's just good business. They, it works. The purpose is not for people to get in trouble, but the purpose is to discover where there's problems, identify the problems, fix the problems, make disclosures that are required. The, a, a good company has a program like this, and it's successful. And NCE is committed to that. It's committed from the very top of the company on down. Uh, they recently published, as I mentioned before, the Code of Business Conduct and Compliance. It goes through uh, Every th or in a, in a surface level, everything you should know about the commitment the company has to uh, being an honest company with high integrity. And it's not just a one-time event. Uh, I'm not here one time to train you all, and you'll never hear about this again. Uh, this will be brought up again in future training events. Uh, there's, there should be annual training that you'll, you'll be able to participate in. And more importantly, if you have questions or you have concerns, at any time there's a, a number of different avenues you can use to contact an individual that can help you with your issue. So this is a 24-7, 365 program. So you have the employee handbook that was published uh, in 2009 and then you have the the code that was published uh, earlier this year. They overlap. There's a lot of similar, there's some similarities between the documents but they really have two different purposes. The handbook gives you the nuts and bolts of what you need to know as a, an employee. So if you need to know how the vac vacation works or when you have days off, or for example, even how the drug test policy is implemented, you'll find it in the employee handbook. This is more, the code is more of just an overarching guide to guide you on decision making as you're deciding what's the best way to deal with an integrity issue that may come up. So under a federal contract, you're not allowed to have drugs in the workplace, for example. The code discusses that. And then the employee handbook goes into a lot more details how, as to how that's implemented within this company. You are required to read this code. I think you have copies. I know you have here in Pontiac for your particular subsidiary, and, and hopefully those of you on the line have copies as well. The last page of the code has a pretty straightforward certification that we ask everyone to make to, to confirm that they have read the code and they understand its terms and they agree to abide by the code. So this is the core values that are conveyed in the code and the core values of the company uh, to, to work in an, with honesty and integrity, to have accountability, to have trust between both management and employees going both ways and with, between coworkers, and that uh, these things will lead to performance excellence for the company, that the, the company will be a better company as a result. So the company has, first of all, 
the, an individual who's responsible for, and it's Alan Rakoff, he's over here to my right, he is the compliance officer. So he is ultimately responsible for implementation of this program. If you ever, you'll see here in a second, uh, you can contact him if you ever have issues that, with regard to how, uh, what steps you should take if a compliance issue comes up. Uh, and he's, uh, he's responsible for making reporting to, uh, to ensure the training occurs in conjunction with us. Uh, now there's other, other things, other individuals you can contact other than Alan, but you certainly can contact Alan if you ever have, and we encourage you to contact him, if you ever have an issue that you're not sure how to deal with. The purpose of making a reporting is not to get people in trouble. It's not to, you shouldn't feel like that if you, uh, if you report to him that there's going to be repercussions for you. There may be if you've done something wrong, but really the purpose of the reporting is that the matter can be more fully investigated and correct steps can be taken to rectify whatever issue has been identified. But if you're not com com comfortable talking to Alan, you don't want to make that contact with him because it would not be anonymous. You either can email him or phone him or send him a letter, but any of those three uh, ways of contacting him, of course, will not be anonymous. You also can make an anonymous, an anonymous report through an online website called Ethics Point. Uh, it's actually, I went to the website. Uh, it's actually a, a well set up website. It's very easy to use. Uh, you, it walks you right through it step by step. I put in the uh, the training, the different links you have, but you really, I mean, it, it's pretty self-explanatory. The uh, code is available on the website if you can't get it anywhere else. And it's got different areas you can make a report. You, can, you don't have to make your report anonymous through this website. You can certainly include your name. And we'd encourage you to include your name because if we know who is making the report, it makes it easier to investigate what occurred because otherwise we don't know who to contact to get some more information if needed. But again, if you're not comfortable with providing your name, you go to the particular area where you've identified a potential problem, such as a conflict of interest. You can go in there, type in what you've uh, identified, and then there will be follow-up investigation into the matter. If the issue involves something with regard to uh, auditing or accounting, uh, there's an additional person you can contact. If, if the ethics point doesn't work for you or contacting Alan doesn't work for you, you can also contact Don Quinn, and uh, he will be uh, available to you to talk about anything regarding, regarding uh, accounting and accounting records, expense reports, timesheets, things of that nature. That's also available to you and there's Don's contact information. And then finally, Foley and Lardner has been retained to serve as compliance counsel as, as well as government contract counsel. Uh, and so if none of these, if you don't feel comfortable with any of these other ways of addressing an issue, you can also contact our law firm through that contact information as well. So uh, there should not be a lack of ability to find the person or to find the way of reporting an incident. There's a lot of different ways to do it, and I think everyone would be comfortable with one of those ways. So in the unlikely event, uh, NCE were ever to face a government investigation. And these investigations occur Sometimes because a company has done something wrong, sometimes because a company has ab done absolutely nothing wrong, but isn't tied in with another company that may have done something wrong. So you shouldn't draw any inferences or conclusions based on the fact an investigation may have been opened and that people at NCE are, are being, asked to, uh, being asked to discuss what may have occurred. So uh, the worst thing you can do is not fully cooperate. In fact, what you're directed to do is cooperate with the government investigation. Uh, but there's certain steps you should take if you f become aware of a government investigation. Um, make sure you contact someone that if you are informed that the government is investigating something with the company. It's not for the purpose for the, so the company can cover anything up, so, but it's rather for the purpose that we can make sure that we provide the information the government's looking for, exactly what the government's looking for, and we can provide the right personnel to ask the questions that the government's seeking answers to. So please uh, use one of those contact information vehicles to, if you become aware of a government investigation involving NCE, and then you'll be given further direction to, as to how we fully cooperate with whatever questions are being asked or whatever information is being required. As you can see uh, at the bottom of the slide, uh, we always want to be honest if we, in all our dealings, but particularly if the government uh, is conducting an investigation and, and mo is, is probably is most important is uh, don't feel like you should destroy any documents 
Uh, usually when an investigation begins, we'll, we'll discuss it with you, but just preserve the documents so that there's not, usually it's not, be, documents are destroyed not because somebody's trying to hide something, but because they just normally destroy the documents and it gives the appearance that, that something is trying to be hid when in fact nothing is trying to be hid. It was just a, an inadvertent destruction of a document. So you have to be very careful in that regard. Uh, one other thing on a government investigation is, and as well as anything involving compliance, it is very important. Uh, if the, the two takeaways are who you contact and, their, and their retaliation against an individual making a report or cooperating with an investigation or anything else won't be tolerated. This is an environment where it, this is the encouraged correct action to take. And so it won't, there will be no tolerance for somebody retaliating against an employee doing the right thing by making a report or cooperating with a government investigation as directed by the company. Okay, uh, common sense things, uh, the, the, these things you know, but we'll go over them again. Discrimination is not uh, uh, tolerated at NCE or subsidiaries. Kind of straightforward, no discrimination, no harassment, and don't retaliate against somebody who makes a report. Uh, frankly, it's the law, it's required by law, it's in your government contracts, but even more importantly, it's, it's key to having a successful company. It's, it just doesn't lend itself a, in a, an environment where people don't feel welcome, doesn't lend itself to a productive environment. So the common example you hear with uh, harassment is the off-color joke. Uh, even if you think you're doing it in private with an individual, you think it's okay to make the joke to that individual, it's not, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable at the company. If you want to do something in your, in your private capacity, uh, that's one thing, but if you're in the company, you should act professionally at all times. Even with those individuals, you may think it's okay to make these jokes too because uh, it's not, uh, it, it could be misconstrued, it could be told to others, and maybe the individual you think finds it funny doesn't find it funny. It's just not, it's just not worth doing and it's, it's not appropriate in a professional setting. Conflicts of interest. Uh, the company deals with a lot of other businesses and the primary thing uh, NCE, you individuals who work for NCE, NCE need to be aware of is when you're dealing with another company, your primary uh, focus is doing the best for NCE. So if you have a outside employment, you need to make sure that that employment outside of NCE is not inconsistent with what NCE does, that it could, that it doesn't have a bad uh, potential image to NCE. So if you're involved in anything controversial, uh, you shouldn't because uh, if people can construe that as being, uh, you being an NCE employee doing something that bring, brings discredit upon the company. Uh, and of course you need to devote your energies primarily to NCE as an employee. So you, if you're doing something outside of employment, it can't inf infringe on the time you spend uh, working on NCE matters. Uh, even more importantly or equally importantly is you need to make sure that the decisions you make for NCE are strictly based on what's in the best interest of NCE and not based on what may be in your personal financial interest because you have a, a spouse or a sibling or you have an investment in another company or you're a director or you're a partner of another company and you want to steer, steer business to that particular company. Uh, that is not appropriate. It may be okay because that's the best business decision for NCE to do but that needs to be the focus. And so if you are uh, engaged in outside employment, you need to make sure that if you're in a level of leadership in that uh, company, that you make sure NCE is aware of it and has approved that relationship. Because if they're not aware of that relationship, they may not be aware of the fact that there may be a conflict between your, your interests as a partner or an officer with this company and your interests as an employee with NCE. So the key takeaway is if you think there's anything you're doing or anybody else you know is doing in terms of outside employment or outside financial interest that could infringe on that person or your ability to make an objective determination as to what's best for the company, you need to let the company know so that they can make sure that uh, there's no issue with you doing what you're doing and so you got approval to do what you're doing. So again, the decisions that the company makes and, the, and you as a representative of the company need to be made on what's in the best interest of the company, not what's in the best interest of you financially or personally. And you need to make disclosures if you think, or an outside person looking at the situation may think that your objectivity in a particular matter uh, may be interfered with because of your outside interest. Make the report, there's nothing, there's no adverse action for making a report. Find out if it's okay. And if it is okay, you can continue on. If it's not okay, then you're going to have to discontinue that 
that particular endeavor. Gratuities and business courtesies are important in, uh, in all settings in business, but they're particularly important in the government contract setting. I'll discuss the differences between the two. There's actually two different standards that are employed in the code. Uh, and the reason for that is what's acceptable in the commercial setting and what is normal business in the commercial setting and what's kind of common sense okay in, to a normal person is not always okay in the government contract setting. There are very, very strict rules and you need to at least have an awareness of them to realize that when you're dealing on a government contract as a prime contractor or a subcontractor, you have additional requirements or additional restrictions with regard to uh, providing gifts or gratuities. So the overall policy is you shouldn't offer or accept something as a gift from somebody you're doing business with and if it's going to influence the particular business deal that you're working on. There's nothing wrong with a gratuity occurring. There's nothing wrong with outside the government contract setting of, for example, a lunch event or a dinner event or an outing. But if the particular offer you're making or the, or the, the thing that's being offered to you is given to you to try to get you to, to otherwise to do a decision you wouldn't do, impair your objectivity and, and to make you go with a contractor you wouldn't otherwise go with, then that, that it becomes a problem. So it, if it's an attempt to influence a particular deal, it's not acceptable. Because your, your decision should be based on the merits, not on a particular financial gain you may incur. Uh, kickback laws are also important, uh, in particular in the government contract setting. So this comes up in sometimes in the setting of commission. Uh, so if you refer business, you can't ex don't accept anything of value for that. That's a commission. It can be considered a kickback. So if you refer a particular prime contractor in a government contract setting, for example, to a subcontractor, or, or conversely, you refer a subcontractor to a prime, prime contractor and you set up a deal, and then the subcontractor kicks some money back to you for having made the arrangement, that can be considered a kickback under federal law and it's, it's prohibited and can, can get the company and you as an individual in quite a bit of trouble. So, uh, don't accept compensation for referring business. You can certainly make a professional recommendation if you think another contractor is a good company, say they're a good company, but don't uh, accept money for that recommendation because it can be considered you're, you're, you're taking that money for the purpose of making that recommendation. Um, so if you are in a commercial setting, if you are offered a gift or you are providing a gift, it, sh it, sh it can't be cash. Uh, it's just, there's no purpose, of, uh, there's no religion, legitimate purpose behind giving cash other than an, an, an improper purpose. Uh, but there are reasons why gifts are given uh, in, in the setting of uh, some sort of recognition, for a setting of a lunch or dinner event or a baseball game or whatever. Those are okay. There's a legitimate pur business purpose behind it. It's not just to, so you can uh, gain monetary gain through the, for the gift that's being given or accepted. But it, whether it's monetary or non-monetary, it can never be for the purpose of trying to get you to do something you wouldn't otherwise do, making an objective determination for the company. And if it's of, of something more than trivial amount, $100, you have to report that uh, to your supervisor to make sure that that supervisor is aware of what's going on. And if the supervisor has any concerns, he, can let, he or she can let you know about it. Uh, or can seek advice from the, you know, through the various compliance uh, officer reporting that we have to make sure everything's okay. So the, you can never go wrong by at least informing your supervisor if you're talking about something of, of a high dollar value uh, to see if there's any problem with accepting the gift or giving the gift. And by high dollar value, it's $100 or more. Okay, if you're in the government contract, government uh, contract setting or doing business with the government, either as a prime contractor or a subcontractor, the rules are much more black and white and they're just that gifts cannot be given and gifts cannot be accepted. Uh, in the federal government setting, there are very limited, very, very limited exceptions to this. Uh, but rather than getting down, and the government, most government uh, individuals you work with are very aware of this and they, and they make sure that they don't accept a gift anyway, no matter how tr uh, minimal the amount is. So to make it easy, just don't do it. The, anyone who does, does government business understands that uh, it's, it's, this is the way business is conducted when you're doing government contracts. Uh, and you don't want to bring, make it appear, even though you're trying to do what you would normally do in a commercial setting uh, and you're, you think it's normal business to buy lunch for individuals, just, you just don't do it in the government contract setting. 
you, uh, you let everyone take care of their own expenses, and everyone accepts that as the way of doing business when you're doing government contracts. So the example here is you have to be careful. What's trying to be conveyed in this example is, is if you're dealing, for example, in this case with an office supplier and, and they want to sell product to NCE to, to equip an office, and then they say, by the way, in addition, you know, if you make this deal, I'll give you a personal side benefit of a, a, a significant discount on something for you to buy personally. That's obviously going to, or it's not obviously, at least it's going to give the appearance that your decision to go with this particular company is being influenced by this personal benefit you're going to gain. So you shouldn't accept that gift. You can't accept that gift. Uh, it's not available to anyone else in the company. It's only available to you. And it's being made available to you most likely because they want you to make a decision for the company that's going to be in that supplier's best interest. And it could uh, infringe on your objectivity. When you're using company resources, it should be strictly for uh, company business. Uh, I'm not going to contend that uh, personal emails are not allowed and, and uh, using telephone for personal business is not allowed. But really the standard is it, you need to minimize that. You need to make sure that when you're, doing, you're on NCE time, you're doing NCE business. And the reason for that is obvious. Uh, it can reduce the productivity and profitability of the company. Uh, and, if, and in more serious instances, it can be, uh, you know, it can cause a significant loss to the company. I'm not talking about the personal, on a personal email or, or telephone call home, but people who take uh, equipment home with them for significant periods of time without any approval to do so. If you're going to take equipment home, you need to get approval to do it and make sure it's okay. Uh, you deal with a lot of, some of you deal with a lot of confidential information. This is a reminder, uh, personal information. Uh, you need to make sure that that information is protected. You also deal with some intellectual property information in terms of plans. You need to make sure that information is protected. Always make, always when you're dealing with information of a sensitive nature, be in the back of your mind thinking about, I cannot, you, how do I make sure that this is not released to the public? Uh, it can bring severe liability on the company if uh, confidential personal information is released to the public. Uh, if it's proprietary information, similarly, there, there could be a li lot of liability placed in the company for releasing that information. It's important in all settings, government contract setting in particular, but in all settings that you keep the time and labor records accurate. You maintain the books uh, exactly as, they, as the work transpired. You don't uh, fudge the numbers. And I, I think a lot of times the, the numbers get fudged sometimes downward or, or placed in another uh, category because there's an, a feeling that maybe I shouldn't charge this much to this particular category. If you did the work in a category, charge it to whatever the category is. Just honestly assess the work that you've done and document it that way. I don't, I don't think a lot of times it's done to get more money. It's sometimes done because of, there's a, a feeling that maybe I've charged too much to one area, I should charge it to another area. Charge it to where the work is done. Keep your timesheets and your expense reports accurate. And that's what this example brings up. Uh, you're, getting, you're doing a lot of work, you're getting concerned, you're charging too much particular project, you're inclined to say, well, maybe I should charge something to a different project. In the end, the government's paying, for an example, the government's paying for this anyway. Uh, no, it can get the, gov you can get the company in a lot of trouble because if, it's a, if the records are ever audited and the, you're not appropriately charging the right category for the work that's done, then the company could be liable for the, the difference. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on antitrust laws. I don't think you're going to have antitrust issues in terms of the big picture antitrust. What can happen though is you, you discuss with your competitors pricing on a particular project, whether it's a commercial project or a government project, and you, uh, if you're not careful, you really should never go down that road because it, it can appear that you're trying to have collusive bidding. Uh, if you're discussing what you're bidding on a project, it's not good business anyway, but if you're discussing what you may be bidding on a project and, you're, and you're, the copy comes up and there's somebody else who's discussing what they may be bidding, uh, that's, it's, it's illegal because it, it could be viewed as you're making sure your bids come in at, at a rate that, that you can make more money than you would otherwise. It's a free market economy. You should bid a project on what, the, what you feel is the right price for the project independent of what anybody else is doing or at least information you gather that's uh, not open to the public. Uh, quality control is important. Um, don't be, 
don't cut corners when you're providing product to your customers. Uh, don't be inclined to go outside of what the government specification says on a government contract, for example. If the government contract says use this X product, even if you think Y product is equally as good and, and does exactly the same thing but it's less expensive, don't do that. Uh, it could impact the quality of the product. It also could have the government looking at you as to why you didn't use exactly what the contract called for. If you're ever in doubt as to whether, you know, if you want to ensure you feel that the quality is there but you feel it can be done cheaper, contact the contracting officer on a project. Let that person know what you intend to do or what you would like to do and get that person's approval before you do it. But uh, quality is, is the lifeblood of the company. Produ producing a quality product is incredibly important, so make sure that everything you do is, is done with that in mind and in compliance with contract requirements. I'll go into a little more detail on the laws, but that apply particularly in the government contract setting, but the policy of the company is obvious and that is you're going to do, you must do everything in accordance with the laws, with the regulations, with the ethical standards. Uh, it's important for the, for the company in terms of its image and for its future success and for the, the purpose of not being, uh, having liability incurred against it for, uh, for violations that occur. So. How can you make sure that you don't violate any laws? If, you're, oh, if you deal in an honest, truthful manner at all times, particularly when you're submitting information to the government, you, you, there is no law you could possibly violate when you're doing that. The law, the violations occur is when that doesn't occur. There's nothing you can do, you know, you may provide information in a truthful manner about a violation that occurred, but that release of that information in a truthful manner can never get you in trouble. So always deal in a truthful, honest manner. So what does that entail? Uh, it means when you submit invoices, make sure they're accurate, complete, that you, you're confident that the numbers you're submitting are, are correct. Uh, if you don't do that, you could be charged with what's called a False Claims Act violation, or the company could be. That can bring some significant civil liability. So uh, that can occur both because you purposely overcharge the government, which is obvious, but you, it also could occur because you act with disregard for what the, the amount should be. You don't have sufficient confidence in the numbers. You're not, when you certify at the bottom it's an accurate charge, you haven't made sure that's the case. So when you charge the government, make sure you're charging them the correct amount. Verify everything you submit to the government. Uh, the law has recently changed with regard to the False Claims Act. The government now can hold the company liable even if the company doesn't do anything affirmatively wrong, such as submitting an incorrect invoice. If the government, through its own incompetence, were to send NCA money that NCA wasn't entitled to, NCA is aware, NCA becomes aware of that fact and doesn't tell the government that this overpayment has occurred, NCE would be considered to have made a false claim, which is unusual because they'd never made a claim, but that's the way the law is interpreted. So it's, it, it goes both ways, both what you submit to the government and what the government sends to you, make sure it is correct. And if you become aware of anything that is incorrect, please use one of these uh, various contact, uh, the compliance officer, Alan, or anybody else that I've listed previously to let them know what you've become aware of. I should say that in addition to liability concerns, uh, false claims that can really be costly to a company. Obviously, the integrity and image of the company is hit severely. The damages, they, they can charge a three times damage for every single false claim that they believe has been submitted. And then even more importantly or even more detrimentally to the company, the company could be prevented from getting future government contracts. So it could really impact the company in a significant way in its ability to compete in the future. So it's critical that you make the report if you become aware of anything that's not uh, correct with regard to interaction with the government. Political activities, uh, the company encourages you to get involved politically, but please realize that whatever political activity you engage in is on your own personal time. Uh, that's your personal political act views, contributions, it's not being made on behalf of the company, uh, and it's not being made to try to influence a politician's decision with regard to something that may impact the company unless the company has approved that activity because there's lobbying laws that need, that have to be complied with and if you go out on your own and make a contribution to a politician because you think it may help the company and you haven't got done all the proper coordination on that, 
the company could be held liable for violating uh, the lobbying laws and not having properly documented what occurred. So engage in political activities on your own time and your own personal capacity unless you're pre-approved to do otherwise. Common sense stuff, uh, a, a company that does well has to have employees that are operate in a safe environment. Uh, the, the, the regulations in terms of safety regulations are incorporated in your government contracts. Uh, they're also incorporated in, in general in all dealings you do with, uh, in terms of federal regulations and a safe environment. If you become aware of regulations being violated or an unsafe environment for employees, please report it. Don't let it, don't not act. Don't think it will be, you'll be viewed uh, differently because you failed to take action. You'll be viewed differently if you don't take action and you don't make people aware of what could be an unsafe environment. Uh, don't threaten others in the workplace. Don't be hostile to others. Uh, don't be abusive to others. Make this a professional work environment. There's a lot more about this in the employee handbook. Along with the lines of what I just said, uh, don't threaten others. Uh, there's not tolerance for uh, discriminatory jokes, hostile jokes. Uh, uh, if in doubt, don't say whatever you think may be, con may be funny to you, may not be funny to others. And if there is uh, uh, an indication that there may be th uh, workplace violence uh, and you become aware of it, y you need to report it so that action can be taken. Don't stand by and allow it to happen without taking action if you're a third party or if you're the victim of it as well. Uh, the employee handbook talks about weapons on the job site. The, the policy of the company is that you will comply with work site requirements with regard to having any weapon at the work site. Uh, I will say in a federal contract setting, please be aware of what, what the contract says, uh, particularly if you're on, for example, a DOD installation and you're doing construction work there. There's very strict requirements with regard to having any kind of weapon with you. Uh, having myself, I'm a retired Air Force officer, having seen what can happen if somebody violates that, uh, you don't want to be in that position. So please make sure you understand what the requirements are at a work site before I bring anything like a handgun there. The company is committed to maintaining a drug-free workplace and it also is contractually required to maintain a drug-free workplace because of its government contracts. So uh, there's not tolerance for working under the influence of drugs, working under the influence of alcohol, it uh, infringes, it uh, affects your ability to perform well. It jeopardizes your safety, it jeopardizes the safety of the others, and it jeopardizes the company, and it can bring liability upon the company. So the policy is pretty clear. You may not possess or be under the influence of alcohol or illegal drugs while at work when conducting business or engaging in company activities. So if you have a need for a legal medical prescription, please let the uh, Please, if, you, if it may impact your ability to work, you need to let your supervisor know that you're on a prescribed medication and, and let the supervisor handle it. And we're not going to, obviously the company wants to make sure that you're taken care of from a health and safety standpoint, but that also that the, whatever prescribed medication you're on is not going to affect uh, the safety of you and others within the company so that they can take appropriate actions to protect you. There is a policy with regard to uh, implementation of in the employee handbook with regard to uh, testing for illegal drugs. So if, if there's a workplace accident, the employee handbook uh, specifies that uh, there will be testing to, for illegal drugs or uh, alcohol presence in the individual. And uh, a refusal to submit to such a test could result in the individual being terminated from employment. So going back full circle a little bit, key takeaway from this training today is uh, understand the basic concepts of the code. You don't need to understand it in, in, in nuanced detail, but be an issue spotter. Be aware of issues that may come up that the company should be aware of and then know who to contact if you become aware of these issues. If you have questions, please ask. This is, this is a, a hypothetical that uh, can be uh, difficult to deal with sometimes, you're, it's your, it involves your supervisor, you think your supervisor may be doing something that's inappropriate. Uh, please realize that the purpose of this code, the main, one of the main purposes is for you to feel comfortable to report things without any fear of retaliation. So uh, 
the company will take steps to protect that supervisor who may or may not be doing something wrong. But you who made the report, as long as it's a legitimate report of, of something that this person has done that may be wrong, as opposed to maybe you just are unhappy about a bad performance report and you want to get the guy in trouble. But if there's some legitimate reason you believe this individual has done something wrong, report it and there will not be any retaliation taken against you. And here's who you can make the reports to. Uh, as Alan told me before I made this presentation, he said his name was in there about 18 times. It's on purpose. Uh, we want to make sure you know who you can contact. Your reports can be anonymous, they can be with your name, your, but either way they will be kept confidential and you will not be retaliated for making a report. Uh, I know this, this recording will be made available for those who couldn't come here today. Uh, you are required to take this training uh, this year and then on an annual refresher training afterwards, uh, every year after this. And those of you attending today and those of you watching on the video, uh, once you've read the code and you've uh, uh, reviewed the information I provided, I, we need you to review the certification and sign it and provide it to your supervisor who will make sure it gets to the right individual, ultimately to Alan. And if you have any questions, uh, I know no questions were asked while I was presenting this, but if you have any questions that come up later, uh, use any of the other avenues that are available or you can contact me as well. Any questions at all? I appreciate your time. I know it can be a little dry, and I, and I hope, uh, hope you guys have a good day. Thank you very much.